I was the first person to make shortboards in Ventura. We're probably the oldest surfboard company around still in business. Welcome, Blinky, to the Young Athletic. Thanks for being here. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, uh, it's a good day. When you're 80 years old, every day is a good day. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I have to ask the first question. How did Blinky come about? Your name is Will Hubina. Yeah. And, and Blinky is, come, came from where? It it's, came from high school, basically. Um, I had a younger brother, two years younger than me, when we were going to high school. And my brother, when he was three years old, had uh, retinal blastoma, which is a cancer of the eye. And so they had to take an eye, his one eye out when he was a baby. And so he has always had a glass eye. And anyway, so um, as we got into high school, when my brother showed up as a freshman and I was a junior, um, some of our friends started teasing him because he has an artificial eye and calling him Blinky and stuff like that. And one of my best friends was teasing him all the time. And so I said, hey, dude, you can't do that. Don't call my brother Blinky. And I, I give to all my friends about that. And they looked at me and my buddy, his name is John Rockford. He's a pretty funny guy. And he says, well, too bad. Then we're going to call you Blinky. And that's really what happened. Huh. It's not from shaping surfboards and getting dust in my eyes and stuff, you know, which I did get a lot of dust in my eyes. And, and any shaper's going to have to be blinking with dust in his eyes, trust me, because yeah. that it goes with the stuff. You get a crust in here, you know. And you, but, you know, that's, that's how Blinky came. Um, and, for sticking out for your brother. Yeah, and, wow. and at, at, at first I really resented it. You know, I mean, for years I didn't want to be called Blinky, you know, Blinky. But um, one thing was, and people didn't forget my name. Yeah, um, for sure. So anyway, yeah, I'm stuck with it. I, I've learned to, to love it. I don't know if it, I don't know if anybody else be called Blinky but me. Uh, so yeah, people remember from remember Blinky. They don't remember Bill Hughes either or what the hell I'm doing. But Blinky's great. Yeah, Blinky's unique. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us about uh, how you got started in surfing. Oh, wow. Who inspired you? Who taught you? Well, it, when I started surfing, no one taught people how to surf. Uh -huh. you don't, it's a school of hard knocks. Uh -huh. um, but basically, I started surfing in 1958, 59 in high school. And uh, that was when all the little surf movies were coming out. Gidget and all these things, and people were going crazy over the surfing thing. And so, every everyone would be a surfer. So, where did you it, grow up? Was it here? Uh, no, I was. I grew up in Simi Valley. Okay. Yeah, I was an infla, inland surfer. Okay. In fact, I practiced kneeboarding in at a place called Robinson Lake. It was a little lake in Simi Valley. We all hung out on and bleached our hair, and we used to take and put take uh, baby oil and iodine, and mix it up, and rub it all over ourselves uh, to get a better tan. Did it work? Yeah, you got a good tan, but then I got skin cancer everywhere from it. You know, it's, it's not the right thing to do. We were trying to get – they didn't have sunscreen back in that day. You were yeah. trying to get tan, Yeah. period. So, but anyway, basically, um, friends of ours, ours started surfing. Okay. And uh, different guys would have a board. We'd share it. It'd be two or three of us ride, going to the beach together using a board. And, and then in 59 – Actually, 1960, a buddy of mine named Pat Delaney and I, we got a kit from Surfer Magazine. Basically, this is his idea. And uh, the, the kit came and we made a surfboard. No kidding. Yeah, we made our own surfboard. It was, it was nine foot long and 22 inches wide and about three inches thick. It was made out of, actually, it was a styrofoam kit from Surfer Magazine. And it wasn't traditional foam, so basically it was a styrofoam. So, Did it work? So, well, this is, this is a good story. <laughs> so anyway, so so you'd have to take starch and put crepe paper on with starch because if resin goes on, it eats right into the foam. Okay. So we had green crepe paper. So we did this whole thing in green crepe paper. Uh, then we glassed it. We didn't know anything too much about glassing either. You know, we didn't realize that once you laminate it and that you hot coat it and then you sand it and stuff like that. So it was really a crappy glass job and it, it actually gave you itch in your arms by just carrying the board around. Mm -hmm. And then the biggest mistake we made was to go to Malibu where all the surfers were for, for our debut. Oh, no. our surfboard. Yeah. yeah. That's where we're going. And anyways, buddy of mine, Delaney, he was, we played football in high school together and I, I was a defensive back. I weighed 150 pounds, but he was a tackle and weighed like 230. Okay. So... In retrospect, knowing what I know now, 
a guy his size should never have been on that surfboard. So we went to Malibu, and then we really were just like in the surf movies with Gidget and, and Mickey Dora and everybody on the beach because they were all pointing at us. We're walking down the beach, looked like Mutt and Jeff with this board, but he's carrying it with one hand. And they were pointing at us. It was very embarrassing. My buddy just sunk it like a rock. I went out there a couple of caught a few waves, but I mean that was in my surfing career. That's probably the most embarrassing thing ever. That was my start of making surfboards, basically, mm-hmm. the first one I ever made with a buddy. So anyway, that's a true story. Um, yeah, very humbling. Yeah, I would say sometimes I've heard this like surf culture that can be very territorial. Was that your experience, first time out in Malibu? No, not, it wasn't. That's a whole, you know, it, it, that territorial stuff came with the short boards. Okay. And it came at a later date and when there was more and more surfers. Yeah. But basically when I was a kid, I mean, there weren't people surfing. When I started surfing, um, if there was good surf, we looked forward to other people coming and surfing with us. Like California Street, C Street, we all surfed, you know, and then 59, 60, 61, 62, uh, I was going to college up here, and there just weren't that many surfers. And if we had friends, we'd look forward to buddies coming up from different areas and surfing with us. You know, people, we call people on the phone, hey, come up, the surf's good. Or I'd have a buddy say, let's go surf Rencon, you know, and meet yeah, guys yeah. there. Uh, when I worked for Maury Pope in, you know, 1967 or something, Bob Cooper and I, we'd meet, we'd meet guys from all over at Sakis to surf, or we'd go to Malibu. Guys that come up from San Diego or all kinds of places to meet us, and we'd surf with these friends and stuff like that. So it's a, it wasn't. There weren't a lot of people in the water. No, and so there really wasn't. Uh, you do almost have your incidents, but they really it was the longboard, the golden age of surfing was really a really neat thing. It was a, that that wasn't happening then. You know, with the advent of the shortboard, then it was a different story. Okay. Like, people got very territorial. Uh, but, you know, and then in the olden days, there was only certain surf spots. You know, you could surf at Dana Point. You'd surf in San Diego at Blacks or something, you know. Uh, Malibu, Dana Point, uh, Swamis. There's only so many surf spots on the coast. You know, Rencon, of course, and then Santa Cruz up that area there. So uh, a lot of guys would travel Mm-hmm. to go to these certain surf spots because mm-hmm. because the longboard and being so new people weren't surfing other other areas you were surfing ones where all the but you see your buddies at with a surf we knew was good and that was happening with with the advent of the short board and the leash once the leash came along you could surf anywhere mm. you know but years ago with the longboard there's places that were great looking but you very Bad if you didn't if you lost your surfboard. When when was a leash invented? Those who, who things, came up with that idea? Oh, those things that that leash thing happened probably in about nineteen sixty nine or seventy. Yeah. And the first leash I saw, I was in a surf contest in Santa Cruz, and Jack O'Neill had invented the leash in Santa Cruz, and the leash is what actually he always see a picture of Jack O'Neill with a patch. And that's because the leash came back, hit him in the eye. What he had was he had surgical tubing with a string in it, and then a suction cup you could put on any surfboard. You put the suction cup on, the thing around your leg, and off you went. So and the thing fling back at him in the eye. Oh, wow. So, but that was, a, I went to surf contest. I came back to Ventura with a suction cup thing. And then from there, we made our own leashes. We just, we've got, I got bungee cord basically and, and grommets and stuff and, made a leash where it's strapped around your ankle and tied to your board and off we went. We were making leashes. Yeah. So, yeah. And then with the leash, you weren't losing your boards. You could surf places you didn't surf before, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of places were, you know, had a lot of rocks. So that's kind of what happened. So I see. What about, uh, I saw one interview you talked about not having wetsuits. Oh, no, we're, there weren't <laughs> wetsuits. No. What was that like? Because it's cold well, it here. it was cold. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically, and it was cold. Uh, if the surfers really good, I mean, we surfed all winter, all summer and all winter, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you can only stay out so long. And, right. of course, the thing back then was you were knee paddling. So the only thing in your water were your, your feet and your knees. Mm. 
you know, of course, you get wet starting out there and so forth, and waves hit you if you fell off, but then you're out of the water. So that was a little bit, and that's kind of where that, everybody was knee pad. That's where surf knots came from. I mean, had, there was people out there um, that actually had lumps on their feet and on their knees. I mean, lumps. And these lumps sometimes, you know, you know, water turned purple because yeah. it's so cold. You got this lump, and then of course you've got once you kind of cut open your lump, you know, you get a, you get a thing that never kind of heals because you don't stop surfing, so you got pus coming out of them. Some, you know, things were ugly. Some guys didn't get drafted, you know, into the Vietnam War because they couldn't put shoes on. It was a true story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're out of the water, but then of course. You know, you had towels and beach. Most of the time, like Ventura, really, in the 60s, was a lot, the beaches were different. We had a really nice big beach with sand. We had the longest pier on the coast. The Ventura Pier was 1,870 feet out in the ocean. Really? Yeah. And uh, in Ventura, Harbor Boulevard went under the pier and all the way down to C Street – and uh, C Street was a bunch of old Victorian houses before they tore down the tore them down for the Holiday Inn and the parking structure and all that stuff. But anyway, so the all these sand dunes and and nice sand and ice plant. And as soon as you hit the warm sand dunes, you would we'd roll around like little seals in the sand to get warm. You know, yeah. all kinds of stuff to get warm. Yeah, <clears throat> we had a house there that buddies of mine. When they condemned all the houses down there, all these beautiful Victorian houses, right on Figueroa Street and California Street. Why were they condemned? Well, because the free was going through. Oh, they just needed The free was going to go through. <clears throat> and also they wanted to develop all the stuff, the whole development of the beach down there. So someone bought them all. They condemned them all uh, with eminent domain, they call it. And all these old houses, the people that owned them were moving out. And so some people that stayed there <coughs> before they really had to move out, they rented for some kids. But once they moved out, we had houses to live in. Uh, those guys, guys, there was a house in the corner there right at the end of uh, Figueroa See, Street. We called the House of the Rising Sun. We're different, two, different, two different groups of guys live in this house. So these are groups of surfers living in these condemned houses. Living a bunch of old houses before they got torn down. This and they didn't turn them down for over about a year. Okay, so that's crazy. <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, I had, all my friends lived in this one house on the beach. And what was cool about it was that the bathroom faced the surf break, and you could open up the window and watch people surfing out there. It's like a screened-in surf movie almost. Yeah, yeah. So the story was that. After we'd surf, you're the first one in, coming in, you know, and you ran that, to the bathroom and take a hot shower. To warm up. Yeah, man, yeah. it was freezing. And you'd take your hot shower and watch your friends, you know. Yeah, By the yeah. time that you had enough water, you know, you, there wasn't much hot water left. And then you'd go back out surfing or just, get, you know, clean up and go home. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that was nice to, you know, have a hot shower there. When I'd surf up places like the Hollister Ranch in the early 60s. You know, wow, no no trunks, winter, water, really cold in the 50s, a lot colder in here. Um, yeah, we surfed some sheltered areas there and, 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 again, rolled around the sand to get warm, um, wow. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So the wetsuit is invaluable. It was invaluable. <laughs> they started getting some people in, in the, the mid-60s and early 60s, you know, the early 60s started to come out with – uh, diving type things, beaver tails and stuff, and and uh, vests, things they could get from dive shops. So of course, the first guys with showing up with rubber rat, right, rubber, you know, on them, we always picked on them, calling them rubber rats. You know, I think they were sissies. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were the hoe daddies. You know, there were guys that never surfed, had surfboards and woodies and bleached blonde hair, and they were hoe daddies. So they're posers. Posers is the same thing. Yeah. It's like a skateboard calls a poser. Yeah, yeah. We had the ho daddy. Ho daddies. And but uh, you know, for a while there, uh, everybody wanted to be surfer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. What was that relationship like when surfing took off, and you were an actual surfer, and then you know, well, I mean, a bunch of posers there, coming there on the lot, beach. There was a lot of guys that you know came to the beach with boards and didn't surf, so it didn't matter to me. But the surfing really grew. 
And, uh, and so from the early 60s to about 19, well, to, to the 70s was the Longboard era. Mm-hmm. You know, and once they hit in 66, 67, 68, 69 was start, the advent of the surf shortboard, which people were going to. And there were still longboard companies making longboards, but they weren't making as many because people were going to the shortboard. The shortboards at that time were like mid-lengths, you know, which were typically you're riding a 10-foot board. All of a sudden, you're riding a 7.6 or 7.11 or a mid-sized board, which still was fl- plenty of float. You just had to work harder, but it had much more performance. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I started making surfboards in 1967. You know, so, so you started making shorter boards? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was the first person to make short boards in Ventura. Yeah. So it's just kind of interesting. I had been working for Maury Pope for a long time, and this buddy of mine, Dennis Ryder, and I, we decided to is that when Maury Wh- Pope, yeah. Is that when William Dennis was Yeah, that's born? when it started the William Dennis, so. Yeah, so we rented in Industrial Bay, and we did uh, we built surfboards, did did uh, ding repair, did all kinds of stuff to try to make a living. You know, we did a lot of slip check stuff. That that was a popular thing then. We were uh, doing doily panners and painting these uh, hallucinogenic things on surfboards because in those '60s there, that was the golden age of surfing. But it was kind of hippies, free love, patchouli oil, yeah. a lot of pot. So, <laughs> revolution, <laughs> yeah, revolution, yeah. People on acid trips. St- things were happening then. The '60s was really fun. Yeah, uh, it was a real awakening uh, to younger people, to a lot of people in the '60s. So, talk us through the uh, the early days of William Dennis, because this is a a big surfboard company now. Yeah, well, it's it's really not big. But we're probably the oldest surfboard company around still in business in a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot of old surfboard companies that were in business before us, Mm -hmm. but they went out of business and came back in business. Mm -hmm. But locally, we've had the surfboard-wise, we've been in business since 67 as William Dennis Surfboards. Um, And that's been a, a great thing. It's been wonderful for me. You know, the kind of the history of how the Ventura Surf Shop really started and stuff, and which goes into William Dennis was, the, you know, the Ventura Surf Shop. In Ventura, in the 60s, um, we really only had one kind of a surf shop. And a guy named Bill Fisher, uh, he was distributing resin and fiberglass. And he was also um, selling boards in his shop here in Ventura. Um, there were other brands. The, there, I think he was selling uh, Joe Quig boards up here, something like one of those boards. And a buddy of mine, Tom Hale, worked for him. And so they were starting to make surfboards here in 1959, 1960 in that area there. And, um, and then this guy Fisher got – made a deal um, – with a couple partners, him and Sam Gillard, uh, and they started what was called VIP, Ventura International Plastics. Okay. So in 19... Like a manufacturer kind of thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is big time. Okay. So in 1959 and 60, Ventura had a mass production factory here, probably making more surfboards than anybody. And these surfboards um, went to Sears. They went to... Uh, like all the old D- different department stores yeah. all over the country, and they had the shark, the tiki, different the, models. Yeah, they had the shark, tiki, Duke Kamanamoko, uh, which other ones? They had four or five models of boards. Uh huh. So all, all being produced here in Ventura. No kidding. Yeah, and so that and so anyway, then from that, uh, Tom Hale left there, and probably about nineteen. 61 or 62, and opened up a shop on Santa Clara Street. So Tom was now going to be our first real Ventura local surfboard shape from surfboard shop. And so he had a shop going on Santa Clara, and he was next to another business, which was Yvonne Chouinard. We he was the next Quonset Hut. We were at the very end of Santa Clara, and Yvonne was the next Quonset Hut starting his business of mountaineering. He had a forge going, building 
hammering out pitons and all this stuff was there. So it's a whole beginning of a, a awakening of different things in Ventura. Hmm. And then in 63, Tom Morey showed up, told Hale he was going to make surfboards in Ventura and then asked Hale if he wanted to go, wanted to um, shape his boards. And so Hale went, well, I don't know, why not? So the two of them split the rent on Santa Clara Street, split the phone bill. And so then Tom Morey was making what's called Australian surfboards, which was the first Morey boards ever made were called Australians. And then Tom, Morey's wife, drew up the decals and lambs. And so Tom, in 63, became the Ventura Surf Shop. Morey's wife, Jolly, drew the, drew the decal for him. And then we had a great big long surfboard that they may put Ventura Surf Shop and Mori on. So it was the first Ventura Surf Shop sign. So they made boards out there in, on Santa Clara Street. And in about 1963, 64 is when I started showing up there, surfing and buying, going to get a, a, a new, I had a Tom Hale. And so then eventually I got, I got an Australian for Mori. Mm -hmm. And that, there was only, I don't know, very few Australian surfboards made. What's the difference between an? Is it just the model? Is it the it was shape? His, it was his, his name of it called Australian Surfboards. Okay. Where he got that for from, I don't know. Was it like a different style of surfboard, or was no, it just I a just, different I brand? No, I just I think that was just Maury's thing. It was his own design. Okay, you know, and it, it, the label was a a decal of Australia. I think his Australia was such an influence at the time in surfing. Maury had something going on with that. He just wanted to be different. And then Australia was kind of. Sh when we had the Australian to go back, uh, one of the neatest things that ever happened out of that was Maury decided to do something with surfboards no one else had done. And basically what that was, what he was doing was making the first removable fin. Oh. So Maury invented what's called a pin fin. And what happened was uh, we'd shape the surfboard when it was being hot-coated. And then cut a hole in it, and then uh, take a polypropylene plug, slide it in there, glass around it, and that built a box. Yeah. And the plug we'd have the plug would have a slant in it, so when you hit it, it would come out and not stick. And so anyway, that's so we had this poly. There was and the box went clean through the surfboard from the bottom to the deck. Oh, okay. And then we drilled a hole diagonally through it for a, a polypropylene fin. So, anyhow, at that point, Tom Hale and Maury were making fins for removal fins for surfboards. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, anyway, that was probably one of the biggest things ever to change the surfboard industry was removal fin because that changed how a board would ride. Really? Other than that, really glassy, great big old fins on. So, anyway, so then. What about like. Uh uh, sex wax is that what it's called? Well, and slip checks another story that happened. Okay. That happened at Maury Pope, in in right after the first nose riding professional nose riding contest, Ventura had the first professional nose riding contest in the world, first professional surfboard contest in the world. Yeah, did Ventura. you compete in it? Was that? Did you compete? In oh it? no, no, I wasn't that good. But I was the beach marshal. Okay, but that's another story. Now, I want to hear about the first professional surf competition. Yeah, we can do that some more. But anyway, and then more, Australian became Mori. Okay. So we made Mori Mori surfboards? Yeah. And then Mori was, we only made probably 50 or 60 Mori surfboards. And then all of a sudden, Mori and Pope, Carl Pope, decided to go into business together. So then we became Mori Pope and moved to Front Street. Okay. So, and I was their first employee. Oh, okay. So now we can talk about anything else. Should so you were working for Maury Pope? Yeah. Okay. Surfboards. Yeah. First employee. Me and, and Delaney, Bill Delaney was, and Bill Delaney was a buddy of mine who, who went on later to make movies, free ride, surfers. He made all kinds of movies. He's a cinematographer. Have you been involved in any surf movies? Uh, not really. I was never that good to be in one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'd, I'd like to. But a lot of my a lot of my surfing, I didn't want it. I, I I probably for 25 years I served the Hollister Ranch where you didn't film. Yeah. So, out of respect for the spot. Yeah, it was kind of a thing up there. That's yeah. cool. Um, what about any other innovations? Big innovations to surfing coming from this time period. You well, said I mean, the removable fin. 
Yeah. The, the slip, what do you call it? The slip, oh, slip check. Slip check. Yeah, that was an innovation, but um, the biggest, that, and that happened during the longboard era. Um, in 65, Tom Morey w- wanted to promote stuff. You know, Morey Pope surfboards, and uh, Carl Pope was also making what's called, the reason he went to business, he wanted to make three piece surfboards called Trisex. Okay. Which is another innovation. That was so you could have a board in a suitcase and not pay to have your board on an airplane. I see, I see. <laughs> Just ship his luggage. That yeah. was the idea. Did so, it work? Oh, yeah. Three yeah. piece surfboard? Yeah. yeah, and there's only about 20 of those ever made. Not even that, I'd say 12 or 13. <clears throat> Let me have some more water here. Of course. Is there a surfing music? So, anyway, we had the first professional surfboard contest yeah. here in 1965. <clears throat> and it was the top 20 surfers in the country, where, where we could – best 20 surfers there were. And each each contestant put up money to be in it. Okay. And then we had prize money. And so what happened was the rules were that the nose was considered to be one-third the length of the surfboard. Okay. Okay. And this was a timed event for the nose. <clears throat> so people, oh, try. specific nose writing. Yeah, just okay. And with timing, with stopwatches and stuff, when yeah, you're, yeah. we're on the nose off and on. Um, so guys came up with all kinds of clever ideas to make their boards look longer. Hmm. You know, one guy had had a stick on the end of it. You know, <laughs> where he made another. It was kind of joking, but that's what it was. And my job as a beach marshal was to take all these surfboards and paint their noses. That's what we did. So uh, so everybody's nose was measured, and then we had our time surfing event, which was spectacular. Uh, Mickey Minos was the first year's winner, which is great. What's his name, Mickey? Mickey Minos. Minos. Yeah. Is he He's, local or is he from somewhere Oh, no, else? no. He was, he was down from the uh, Laguna Beach. He was down in uh, the, the area of San Clemente. He actually lives in, lived in San Clemente. Okay. So anyway, he won it, and there was prize money. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of, and slip check came from that because Billy Delaney and I were working at the surf shop. We had just finished, I had, we had, brand, I had just finished glassing brand new surfboards for us, glossing them. And there was a place next to us called Arts Blinker Light. And Arts Blinker Light did all the barricades and, and striping for all the stop sign, where you couldn't feel a yellow stop, stop sign, you know, yeah. stop. Yeah. They painted all that in the road so the cars wouldn't slip. And 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 Interesting. basically, you have this glowing line, and because there's microscopic beads of glass in it, and all kinds of stuff. So it's a little bit thicker to yeah, it was surface. just different, which I didn't know really until this whole thing happened. So um, I taped off our surfboards one night; they were brand new. I just finished glossing them, and ran over to Arch Blinker Light, and he sprayed the the front three feet of our board with paint because we wanted to look like the professionals. That's what we wanted to do. We were cool now. Um, so anyway, then we went to Stanley's Diner Surfing. And Stanley's Diner was a real fun surf spot. You know, it's, it disappeared with the freeway. It ate up. But that was one of the best, great afternoon all day long, socialized, had three or four peaks. Everybody was there. All your friends were there. Going back to the surf competition, where was the surf competition? In oh, is that, it was that what we call the pipe right now. It's the fairgrounds. Oh, the fairgrounds. Yeah, it was at the fairgrounds. We actually had uh, horse races there. Fairgrounds had stables with horses. Wow. So it was, that's another story, too. But anyway, so, so we went to Stanley surfing these boards, and the paint hadn't dried, so we just waxed the back of them and started surfing. Well, as they dried in the water, we started feeling it and going, wow, this is sticky. Yeah. So that's how we invented slip check. We were starting running around there on the surfboards, tr- hopping on the nose. All our friends were feeling, going, "Wow, this is really cool," and uh, it was effective. Oh, and it was incredible. So uh, the next day, we told Maury Pope about it. We got really excited. So then we took a brand new surfboard. Uh, well, a board was Tom was uh, Mike Baylog's board. He was one of Maury Pope team riders, and we sprayed the whole board with the thing, the deck. He went out surfing. It worked great, except he had scabs on his chest, his mm. arms. It was everywhere. Because he still didn't have wetsuits. <clears throat> no. <laughs> so basically what happened was uh, 
you we had wetsuits, but not like real wetsuits, okay. like Farmer Johns and stuff. But so we just ended up doing the nose and tails on the boards. You know, with the peck penetrator, it was just nothing but the nose. Um, so that was the inventor of that. So you were still working for Maury Pope? Oh, yeah. With the invention yeah, of this the... Yeah, this is 65. 65. And then Delaney and I got a royalty from it. We, we ended up can- Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. We ended up canning all this slip check. Slip check went everywhere. We go to all over, all over the country. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge innovation that makes it yeah, I think, a lot easier. Yeah, I think uh, Delaney and I got uh, 5% of the gross. We got 2.5% each of every can of slip check sold, which may not didn't seem like a lot of money, but back then it was a lot of money to us kids. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was a slip check invention. Let's talk about, like, the philosophy of surfing. Hmm. What makes, like, a surfer different than, like, another athlete, like a soccer player or a football player? Oh, I don't I don't really think there's any difference. It's a sport. Yeah. You know, in, in, in professional surfing, they're in a probably more pressure than a lot of other sports. You know, professional surfing, my God, you're under pressure. You've got a timed heat to do so much in that heat. you got, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to catch your three best waves and keep other people. And the waves just don't come every second. Yeah. So you have to get in a rhythm. you got to, I mean. But I'm thinking more like, <clears throat> I feel like the philosophy of a surfer is more oh, relaxed, uh, sure, more but, laid back. Yeah, and in some, well, that's because in the early 60s, they were all stoned. Okay. So they were laid back. <laughs> that it's, helps. It's, it, it is just, it, it's a wonderful sport. And it's, it's a lot like being in nature. I mean, it's you and a wave. Mm. Basically, you're out there enjoying this wave, performing on it, you know, doing as best you can, riding a wave. And it's exciting to do something. It's, it's exciting to catch a, a wave and ride the whole thing to the end and do things on it. And as waves get bigger, it, it's an adrenaline high. You get out some big surf and it, it, it can be very scary. And it's, and it's a dangerous sport. I mean, you could hit in the head real easy and die. You know, I mean, you people, you can drown. I mean, held underwater for a minute or two was no fun. You yeah. know, you, tumble, so, getting yeah. tumbled. Yeah. I guess I've never thought about surfing as like being in nature, yeah, but you is. are. Oh, it's it is nature, and and what's neat was in the early early years of surfing, uh, discovering whole new surf pots where no one else surfed. And yeah, fun. You know, people went to Mexico and surfed places no one had ever been. You know, warmer water. That was a trip then to going to Mexico. Going down where the water was, was, was you know, 75, 80, 90 degrees compared to freezing. Have you gone international and surfed? Oh, I've surfed all over. Yeah. yeah. Hawaii, Australia, Mexico, you know, uh, different islands, you know, uh, the Caribbean. Do you, do you have a favorite? I know it'd be tough to pick. Oh, uh, you know, I, I love surfing at home. I, I think if I... If I want to really do my life as a surfer, I'd probably live in Hawaii. Yeah. I think you have great waves over there. And, and I mean, you can't hardly beat the surf in Hawaii. It's warm. Uh, the, the Hawaiian feeling is great. You know, it's a, I, I love Hawaii and I also love Australia. Australia, Australia is just still a new frontier. Australia is the size of the United States, but basically with one tenth the population. It's mostly on the coast, but Australia. It's a, my, my all my my son, his wife, and all my grandkids live in Australia. Really? Oh yeah, it's beautiful. You know, I mean, you know, the education system for the kids, health systems. You know, it's socialized medicine, socialized schooling. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets treated the same, uh, but the surf is insane. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's some good surf over there. Have you mm-hmm. caught any big waves? Any? Monstrous waves that you can remember? I've caught a lot of monstrous waves, and I remember every one of them. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I think at the time, the equipment I had wasn't the best. Things have progressed so far now that, you know, where I was riding big waves on larger guns and bigger boards, no, that's not happening. These surfers are just super athletes paddling the waves with a lot shorter boards and much more performance. I mean, these guys... They, they don't paddle surfboards and shortboards. The professor to surf will swim those things. They swim under the way, you know, they, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so long ways. Long ways. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so what would you say is your biggest biggest wave that you can remember? Oh, I've, I've surfed some pretty good size surfs at, you know. And Hon where were they? Honolulu Bay and on Maui. Uh -huh. I Why? surfed some great big waves there, real big. Yeah. You know, waves you have to paddle and paddle and paddle down before you stand up. So at there, and then of course, I've surfed monstrous waves at the Hollister Ranch. You know, I mean, Razorbacks, you know. I was surfing so far in the ocean that the Gavita Pier looked as close as the land, as close as the oil derricks was there. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I've scared the hell out of myself. Going that far out. Yeah. Wow. Um, what inspires you to keep surfing? Well, it's just a love. It, love it wasn't it? really making a living at it. I mean, just I love surfing. You know, I mean, my uh, first wife surfed. My kids all surfed. It was a, I lived the surfing life. Mm -hmm. You know, made surfboards, went surfing, tried them. I mean, the whole thing. I mean, if you're making surfboards, if you don't surf, you're not going to be much of a shaper. Yeah. You know, you got to test did, the boards. When did you open your own shop? Well, I owned my own store in uh, 67 when Dennis and I started making our own surfboards. That was on Callens Road in the little industrial bay. Mm -hmm. And we made our boards there, which was great. And then I had a little showroom on Thompson Boulevard. I lived in a house in the back, and in the front was a little, little small showroom. And I did that till 1972, and, and that's when Carl Pope um, – Carl had bought Maury out, and Maury had gone to – Hawaii and invented the boogie board and all that stuff. And Carl was making surfboards and he owned Maury Pope. And then in 1972, he handed me the keys to Maury Pope and he was going into uh, a major business to mass produce short boards called Wave. And they were a, a, a board that was way ahead of its time. It was, uh, it was a hollow surfboard and it was a honeycomb construction just like they made surf skis out of very durable, strong surfboards. And so I, I made the first four or five plugs molds to make these short boards with Carl. Carl gave me the keys to Maury Pope, and off I went and I took over the rent. So then I had a real shop. You're like, you know, I could manufacture there, you know, sell my boards there. Uh, life was good. Yeah. Yeah. This is the golden days for your business? There were really golden days for my business because I, I had a lot of employees. I was. I was shaping anywhere from three to six boards a day, seven boards a day sometimes, and uh, had glassers, you know, had had to teach people how to glass, you know, I had glassers, sanders, glossers. I did a lot of the glossing myself because that's a really important job when you're the glosser. Did you learn all of these skills on your own? Oh, gosh, no. Uh, when I worked for Maury Pope, there was nothing I didn't do there. So you, you know, were learning there. Yeah, okay. I I think I did every job at Maury Pope. Um, and there were experienced shapers. Oh there yeah, the, you know it was like uh, the first guy that was kind of the foreman there was a guy named Richard Deese, and he was down from Laguna Beach. He had worked for for Dewey Weber, who worked for all the places down there. Plus, he made his own surfboards, and so he came up to uh, Maury Pope as our foreman. Okay, and the guy the guy was a, a amazing craftsman. The guy could make, he could do anything with resin. So I learned a whole lot of my trade from Richard, you know. I learned a lot of the glassing, you know, uh, sanding, you know, all my rough shaping I learned from Richard Deese, how to shape surfboards originally. Um, for a while there, when we eventually went and Tom and Carl got together and we ended up making a, a board with a guy named uh, John Peck, the Peck Penetrator, which they promoted. And we actually started the thing. We uh, we glued our own blanks. We did everything with, with a Peck Penetrator. Uh, I took a crash course at Clark Foam, and when we started to make Peck Penetrators, I was gluing blanks. I glued up all the blanks, put the rockers and all the Peck Penetrators. And then I did rough shaped them. I cut the templates out and rough shaped those boards. And that's a Richard Dietz who taught me to do that. And as we were going from the Peck Penetrator, we started doing the blue machine. Dennis Ryder showed up and he started shaping. So uh, then I went back to being the glosser, which is well, one of the most important jobs in the glass shop. Yeah. So uh, anyway, but Bob Cooper was our foreman from in 1967. And Bob really mentored me in a lot of ways and really refined my, my surfing, my 
building capabilities yeah. in the surfboards. And have you passed along the tradition? Have you been? Oh, I tried. Oh, sure. I mean, there's. I had the. Ki- I had kids there that were surfing, shaping for me then. They're shaping now. Yeah. You know, so lots of them. Uh, there are a lot of people in Ventura in the trades worked for me as in William Dennis surfboards. Yeah, without a doubt. Is that fun for you to teach and pass it along? Oh yeah, yeah. That that part's fun. Uh, the most fun I see though is is the, we own the vent. We have the Ventura Surf Shop, and we've. Uh, the Ventura Surf Shop, my first salesman, their sons have worked for us, and now their grandchildren are working for us. Wow. We have raised hundreds of kids in that surf shop. As employees? They, as employees. Huh. They, they start out when they're 15, 16 years old. They get a work permit. Uh, they get a credit for it at school, and they get out an hour early. <laughs> and That's so nice. we still have kids, you know, that come to the shop. We have... Uh, a granddaughter of of one of my first employees working there now. She's sixteen, and the granddaughter of one of my old surfing buddies. His kid hung out there, and now the grandchild's working there. So I have two granddaughters mm-hmm. from this, and a lot of these people have uh, really excelled. They've gone through our shop. They've gone to college, they've gone into business, and they've been successful. So that probably, if, if I did anything to be remembered by in Ventura, it would be, you know, how I've, my wife and I, our, our surf shop has, as a big family, have seen all these people over the years ago. We have a huge family of kids that worked for us. Yeah. And, of course, all our team riders we've had for years, too, all the, all the kids that have sh- surfed my surfboards for a long time. If there's a lot of those, too. So that's been a very rewarding experience for you. Oh, yeah, for what, I, for what I do. I mean, I'm 80 years old. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've had a great, great life. You know, the surf shop, too, you know, um, it's been here. People leave town, they come back 20, 30 years later, they show up at the surf shop and— I know them. You yeah. know, I mean, it's just like a people come here to kind of reminisce their past, if nothing else, or come to see if it's still here. But our business, we've been, we have this, ha, the same phone number since 1967, six four three one zero six two. I mean, that's 58 years, same phone number. That's pretty awesome. Well, it is, yeah. Of course, the bill's going up. Ha! That's funny. Uh, you mentioned this team riders. Do you have a lot of team riders and oh, yeah. currently and former? And sure. What, team, what's that like? Team riders are great because basically um, <clears throat> their input on how surfboards work is important. you got a super talented person out there to help, and you put them on a surfboard, and they ride it. And you watch them ride it, and they give you ideas. They'd like them to do this or that, or, you know, to improve the surfboard. So I can't go surf. I'm 80. You know, I'm, I was quite capable till 10 years ago. I was doing my own research and development. Mm-hmm. But when you're in the 70s, you're not like a kid that's 17 years old. And so these kids really give me good endpoint. I have all the knowledge and the ideas, and I take that, and they test it. And, and they're great. I mean, they're yeah, kids on your board, so the kids see them, they want to buy your boards. That's kind of how the team rider thing works. Yeah. And all these kids, again, have all grown up, you know. Uh, it's pretty exciting. You know, one of our one of my cashiers, her daughter's on our surf team, you know, <laughs> old cashiers. So we get a lot of family kids, too. Yeah. Do they uh, compete under under your surf job? <clears throat> oh, yeah. There's surf contests all the time. Yeah. Um, and they compete, yeah. It's and it's great that they do good in contests too. There's a lot of kids now. I mean, Ventura. Um, we have some top surfers in Ventura, and we have a lot of girls and guys that compete professionally. And uh, I'm actually trying right now to work with people in Ventura to promote professional surfing in Ventura. Um, what does that mean? Like to get a league well, started? Take, see, Ventura really, it, we had the first professional surf contest here ever. And there's a lot of contests, but they really don't have that many professional ones. We have club contests. 
uh, we have the surf rodeo. I've heard about yeah that kind of thing. And, and there's 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 different contests for kids in high school and stuff in college. Um, so there, there are more people trying to do professional surf contests. The shortboard thing's no problem because that's big time money, but the longboarding isn't. So I'm I'm trying to uh, get with different people of Ventura, you know, of different organizations to promote professional surfing and hopefully put on, get some contests here in Ventura. We have a couple different contests that are put on in Ventura, one for guys longboarding and one for girls and one for all of them, different professional contests. So, and then these kids want to travel, but they have no money. Mm. You know, they're, they're not sponsored. You know, they, they don't have that much money. Uh, so to hopefully get these kids to where they can travel and go to their contests, kids from Ventura. So that's yeah. I'm working on that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what I want to do with this podcast is get more exposure to coaches oh, yeah. and athletes. To yeah. Well, it's, it, it needs a Ventura. Ventura is kind of the unknown surf mecca. Mm. We're, we're Santa Cruz and Huntington Beach are the surf capitals of the world. But there's a lot going on here in Ventura. And I think mile for mile, we have more surf Ventura than anywhere. We go all the way from county line to Rencon. That was a lo lot of surf spots. Yeah. Is the Rincon Classic a pro event? They they had a pro one this year, semi-pro one. Okay. Um, and they have they have they really haven't had a professional type thing. We pay. A, they had a pro contest this year, but it included a lot of people. It wasn't your where you take top twenty surfers around or top thirty. And, and that's the kind of contest I think you need is get your, your top 20, 20 men in the, the, in the country, your top 20 women that will come to a contest mm -hmm. and, and, put, and, and have prize money. Without prize money, no one comes. Right. So you can't, you're not going to get a really good surfer to spend two or $3,000 getting there if you're not competing them in 10 or something. You right. Know. So we need to raise money and have a good contest. That'd be cool. I mean, we had the X Games last summer. Yeah, the X Games is a whole different thing. But that's put on so by people with more money. It would have been cool to have like an auxiliary surf competition. Yeah, just because it, it's right on the pier. I mean, right on the yeah, Sea Street. I mean, right at the fairgrounds. It would it, that if they all went together and X Games wanted to put a professional f surfing contest on, it could be done. That would have been cool. You know, of course, like anything else, <clears throat> when you do a professional surfing contest, it, it depends on waves. Mm. I mean. Uh, you've got to have a surf contest that has a window yeah. within, within, within a month. Yeah. And you need the proper high tides and low tides. You know, you can't have one guy surfing at low tide and getting perfect waves, another guy at high tide not getting a wave at all. Yeah. So it's got to be competitive. What's the best time of year to have a surf competition? Is there a better time of year for the waves? Winter has better waves in the winter mm -hmm. than in the summer. Generally, there's more consistent swells in the winter. It's usually bigger. So, so would that be the ideal time for a surf competition? Yeah, I, I think I think any time from uh, from September to June, you could have a contest someplace. Okay. So, but yeah, I mean, winter swells usually when we get the really good surface in the winter. Yeah. If you were to give a thirty-minute presentation on something other than surfing, if you had to do it impromptu. Or maybe a 10-minute presentation on something yeah. Yeah. other than surfing. What would it be? Oh, I could talk about lots of stuff. Uh, hmm. I, I think I would like to talk about travels, going different places. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of places. A lot, you know, because of surfing, you go to places you never go to. I mean, I really would love to travel. There are still exotic places. I mean, I, um, we took, my wife and I took a trip to Tortola. Where is that? I don't even know where it's that the is. British Caribbean. Oh, okay. And which was because there were surf there, of course. You know, I surfed this place called Little Lapa Bay, which is insane. <laughs> it's like a rights and lefts in warm water, Caribbean, beautiful. But from uh, Tortola, which was a whole different experience because the British Caribbean. And it's really proper English. I mean, I felt like a hick because hmm. everybody talked <laughs> English, you know, good English. Even in the ocean? Everybody was 
very sophisticated, it sounded like. But what happened there was there, there's four or five, six islands. There's island chains out there. So every day you can get on a ferry and hop in that ferry and go to a different island. Hmm. Get on the island, spend a couple hours looking around, get back in the ferry, come back. Uh, so any kind of travel, I would, I, I mean, I could talk about just the trip. We were there for two weeks and had an insane time. And the different people's customs, what people were like, what things cost. I mean, holy cow, there's no, there's no, uh, alcohol is tax free if there's no tariffs on alcohol or anything. You can, you can drive a car and rum cheaper than you put gas in it in that island. Huh. Yeah, a good rum. <laughs> anyway, see, and, and the, the Caribbean, uh, Tortola, the, Carib the Tortolans are, are black, which is, I'd never been on an island where all the owners of the land, everybody is like that. And they're beautiful people. Like I say, they talk, uh, they're educated. Mm -hmm. I mean, they own everything, beautiful society, um, no prejudice at all there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, so any anyway, islands are different. You see different things on different islands. Uh, we went to a little place called Purser Island where they made Purser rum, which was kind of fun. But I, I would just talk about play. I'd talk about Mexico all day, traveling all over Mexico. I love Mexico. So travel, huh? Yeah, especially in you know, the early days when people hadn't. You know, I'd been on different surf spots in Mexico, so I could talk about that. I could talk about, yeah. I've had some great experiences in my life, and I, uh, I'm sure I could find more and more topics. Yeah. What would you say, what advice would you give one, give someone who's just starting out surfing? Starting out surfing? They're going to have the time of their life. Because really, it's a learning thing. And when you learn something, you get excited. The best advice is to get a, a surf lesson and get a board that's a proper size for you. And you want to get a board that's too, too big for you so you can catch a lot of waves because you don't want to struggle and get one wave an hour. You want to get 10 and learn. Mm. So you need a lesson. You need a wetsuit. Um, and you need a, the proper equipment, the board that's, that's big enough to give you a catch a lot of waves. And you want to get a really shitty board because you're going to drop it, ding it, get run over and become a kook. You're really a kook. But the best part about that is uh, that every day, the day you stand up, you're freaking out. Oh, my God, I stood up. You know, then as you ride the wave, every time you do something, it's a rush and it's a thrill, perfecting your skills. And since you're such a beginner, you're learning stuff every day. Then you hang out with people, your own surfing kind of skills and stuff, you know, and there's, there's a lot of camaraderie. Uh, hopefully people won't yell at you and stuff because you, you will be in the way of everybody. <laughs> uh, so you usually have to go to places that other people don't go to because, you know, you just don't want to go to C Street on a good five-foot day if you're a beginner, you know. Most people go up to Fria Mondo's and surf and learn to surf there at a gentle beach. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the learning curve, it, it's so incredible. And then as you perfect your skills, whether it's longboarding or shorting, shortboarding, you're, you're learning and, and – and getting exhilarated every day. Oh my God! I did the best off the lift it ever. You know, best what, nose ride. Yeah. What do you see the future of surfing? Wow! I, I, the future of surfing uh, is really changing. I mean, there's there's still great surf in a lot of places, but what you're starting to see is some artificial surf, which is perfection. Yeah, um, like those big. Like I think I've seen like a facility in Texas that just well, there's puts waves. Out that, waves. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a place in Lemoore here in California with a perfect wave. Mm. Places in Texas with a perfect wave. There's all these time these places generating waves that are not near an ocean. Yeah, yeah. And th th this can give you another story too. Is a I went to the first man-made wave ever and surfed, and that was in the seventies. <clears throat> and it was in Tempe, Arizona, Clairol, who was a big manufacturer. They had a lot of money. So they built the first wave pool, which looked more like a toilet bowl. It was a giant big thing like a back of a toilet. Huh. 
and had a ramp you walked up to and had a shooty chute coming down. And what happened was these pumps would pump all the water up on top of this thing and then flush like a toilet. What, it, the waves would come out of the bottom just rumbling like this and then form and reform actually into little waves you surfed. So when Carl Pope started promoting the hollow wave surfboard in the 70s, him and I went to Mexico surfing and, and, and testing a lot of boards, doing, having fun stuff. And so we were, we were surfing down in Mata Chin Bay and uh, riding waves. We were having a good time. Mixed up. On the way back, we're coming through Arizona, and we decided to stop at this wave pool. Well, there we were at the wave pool. My van, I, we had, I had a motor home. It was full of hollow surfboards. And they were out, we were riding surfboards and showing the kids in Arizona. They had surfers there. And I met these two surfers in Arizona who were the surf champs, Clyde and George, surf champs in Arizona at this pool. Got to know them, surfing with them, everything. And the pool, this wave pool would have surfing for an hour, and then they have free time. And this is in... July, and it's 110 degrees in Arizona, and there's probably a thousand people at this thing. Wow. Not exaggerating. And all these people get out there on their, on their, on their rubber rafts, boogie boards, anything that floated, and the thing would flush, and it'd be nothing but people being catapulted up over each other It's going to the beach on this thing. Huh. That's awesome. So... Anyhow, so I got to be surfing with these two guys, Clyde and George. I came back home to surf. I took pictures, the thing, everything. Came back home and told some kids about it at the surf shop, or Bob Gibson and Pete Bundy and another kids. And, this, and I said, here, take the motor home and go surf this wave in Arizona. So they went there. Well, they got to be really good friends with Clyde and George. And when they came back, they brought the two kids from Arizona with them, the surf champs. Mm-hmm. They had never surfed in the ocean. No kidding. Never. Wow. <laughs> never. So they got to go surf in the ocean for the first time. So what's going to happen is you're going to have these wave pools everywhere. People never surf in the ocean. And they'll develop into good surfers. I mean, yeah, they're surfing rivers. They're surfing lakes. So you'll probably see surfers that are as good as it gets that have never been surfing in the ocean. Have you caught a perfect wave in the ocean? Oh, God, yeah. I've caught perfect waves. I've had my share of perfect waves. I have no, no doubt in my mind. Is there anything better than a perfect Nothing wave? Nothing better than a perfect wave. No. No. Just like in the movies, you know, get excited. I mean, people get, really get excited after a perfect wave. A good ride? Wow. Yeah. It's adrenaline. It's a good feeling. And... You know, it's a forced exercise. There aren't a lot of fat surfers. You know, it keeps you in shape. So. Did you know it was a perfect wave while you were in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you can come up to a surf spot and you'll see perfect waves. There's a lot of them when you come up there and go, oh, my God. And you're rushing to get your wetsuit on to get out there. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's not unusual to serve perfect waves. Okay. We're pretty fortunate in Ventura because we have Rencon. You can get a perfect wave at Rencon. You can get a perfect wave at Malibu. Good surf around here. But then even the beach breaks, the shorter rides. I mean, shorter rides are perfect too. So, no. Yeah. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about, Blanky, or should we wrap this up and well, save it for the next, next time? I- I mean, I can talk all day, but I think I'm done. I've, I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, I've been speaking with uh, legendary surfer and shaper Blinky of Ventura Surf Shop. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you.